This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is a noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here and Bert Lum in the downtown Honolulu studios overlooking the harbor here of Think Tech Hawaii. And standing by, we have in uh, San Francisco, California, we have John Mullen, uh, CEO of Promia Incorporated, a high-end uh, network and cyber organization. And we're here talking about something that is related to drones, although we don't have any drones on the table, which we normally would come in with, because drones tend to make you focus on the drone, right? right? We're talking about the cyber substrate that operates behind drones and just about everything else. And uh, the reason we're talking about this today is uh, the event on Saturday, mm -hmm. which was a cyber event uh, to a certain extent, and uh, certainly uh, was actually, in my mind, it was really good that that happened. Yes. I think that we're gonna learn so much from yeah. that, and as soon as the witch hunting is all over, yeah. and people get back to work <laughs> and get things done and, and, uh, and stop uh, stop beating on people and they'll start getting getting something really good done out of this. Maybe we can move Hawaii from kind of the back of the bus to the front of the bus in this regard and with the help of guys like Bert and, and John Mullen. So what we had, uh, and, and we're doing this in the spirit of, of Daryl Wong, by the way, who's not here on the show, but it would certainly be thinking along with us uh, in this domain. How do we think of what occurred, occurred on Saturday? It Basically, something shows up here on, on my cell phone and suddenly out of the clear blue sky, I've got something that I, I've got to deal with. I may, I've, I've got to audit it, I've got to assess it, I've got, or I can do none of that and react to it. But in the world of, that we've fallen into here of so much dependence of the population on these commonly available systems, which we have no idea their credentials or their qualifications, yet we depend on them. How do we, how do we result in a sort of a trusted system that can operate within that we can, with confidence, use, and use that to conduct our lives appropriately, but not get uh, sideswiped by things that are either errors or are malicious uh, attempts to uh, get into us. So that's where John Mullen uh, thinks a lot uh, from the cyber and network perspective, and Bert Lum thinks a lot about that from uh, many perspectives here in Hawaii. So. Uh, let me just ask you, Bert, to start that, sure. that yeah. reactant. How do we deal with something like this, or the information that comes on it, in a trusted way? Well, so let's frame this scenario up for our watchers, or vi our, our uh, they, they would be listeners and viewers. Viewers, yeah. viewers, yeah. not yeah. listeners. Not listeners, <laughs> where you're normally from, right. Yeah. So the, the situation is that there is a trusted source, right, and I, I, I've already, um, uh, gotten alerts from the folks over at the Hawaii Emergency Management uh, Agency. And this is a pretty broad, let's say, um, message that goes out to basically a million people, everybody who has a smartphone, okay? And the, the situation is that if, if that many people get this message, the question is, how do you actually verify that it's authentic? How do you as an individual right. who may so, not have any knowledge of what the Situations, right? Yeah. So the so number one is that you you've already gotten it from a trusted source. I'm already acknowledging it as a trusted message that's come in from a trusted source, but it's pretty it's pretty um, major, right? I mean, it's a it's a. I do want to go back to that in a minute. How does a person know it's a trusted source? We'll get there in a minute. Right, but, right. Okay. But you've received it, and it's a it's a very high impact message. High impact. High Got impact it, right. message, right? So then the first thing that I would do is, number one, look at each other and say, did you get that message too? And because uh, others that, uh, we were over at uh, Impact Hub over at Kaka'ako, we were actually doing the, the Ag Hackathon. So we're doing the Agathon. And others got the message. So that validated that others were actually getting this message. So it wasn't like I, I only got it on my phone. The other thing is that I would start to look at whether or not other news sources other trusted sources were also getting this message. So then, you know, I would go to the, 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 the TV station's website, or I would go to uh, um, Twitter. I would look at Twitter. I would look at the, uh, the folks over at uh, uh, DEM with the city and county. And, and I didn't see anything. So then, then you start to think, well, if this is such a major high impact message, shouldn't other sources of messages 
also reflect that? So assessment is the first thing you would do, assessing it by looking at multiple sets of information you know are also from trusted sources. Right. So you're, right. you're, do, you're doing that. That's a relatively informed perspective because that means you have already knowledge of where these other trusted sites are. I would suggest that the average person probably doesn't have access to that kind of information. So the average person simply is responding to what comes in on right. this. Right, right, I right, came right, right, from right. a little different perspective. I said, the message, the structure doesn't look right to me. You know, Pacific Command is not where you're going to get a missile alert from. You're going to get it from uh, uh, NARAD. You're going to come from FEMA. So the, the source didn't look right to me. So I thought. But this, but, this but, but okay. But uh, I'll ask you. In terms of Pacific Command, Pacific yeah. Command is the folks over at you know at Pearl Harbor, right? Yeah. Why would you not consider that as being a, a trusted? That would be a secondary source. The primary source to us would come through NORAD or through okay. FEMA, and then you get other validation. Okay. So I would have a different perspective. But anyway, uh, we had no choice but mm -hmm. to respond mm -hmm. in kind and shelter in place and such. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's turn to John for a minute. John, what we're speaking of here is, of course, trusted networks that work all the way from the top security level down to the handheld device I've got in my hand. Uh, your view is, John, on how we're going to get to the point where uh, something coming out of here is as, as Bert is saying, is totally trustworthy and we can do an assessment as individuals. Uh, what kind of personal accountability or personal preparation is required to get to that point where we can actually make those judgments? Well, I think Bert's right in what the natural human reaction is. is to, And he's right on, the, on each tip, too. Uh, whether he's an expert or not, that's what people do. They, they look at other sources. I see that it happened to other people. And then they try to say, how else would I know? Because it's a natural thing. And, and by the way, when you study security, you study how humans react, and you know this is very, very basic. Um, but it, it is also, I mean, this one incident about a potential nuclear strike is very high impact, obviously. But there's a lot more going on every day in the news sources that isn't right. And the issue of of being uh, vigilant and also suspecting and skeptical. It's a very big issue and it's very important right now because technologically, I mean, we're working on with a lot of people on, uh, on new technologies that will provide a complete trusted source, the quantum machines and networks, but they're not gonna be here in the next short period of time. Uh, so people need to be more vigilant. And I think your, your point about the analysis is correct. Uh, and I'm finding it a little bit more than just a, a potential nuclear attack, but just information. Uh, because remember, uh, they've already admitted, not just Russia, but many other countries, that they constantly try to manipulate other people's elections. Uh, and we're the most vulnerable because we're the most wired network. So in it, it, by, by getting into Twitter and some of the others and doing certain things, even things that aren't even illegal, you could bend uh, millions and millions of minds, and it happens every day, unfortunately. So I, I'm a little bit more of a proponent of anonymous behavior. I certainly support lawful intercept for police and fire and military. There has to be a focus for them to be able under purview, maybe warrant like they do with warrant searches or things like that. But, but uh, at the same time, we need to be able to be anonymous. And I, there's a whole set of tools. You can download them. They're all free. It takes a little bit of time to catch up and do it. But uh, you can be anonymous where the uh, systems can't trace you, and then they can't feed you information uh, based upon your particular person. And this is what the, the different large systems, Facebook and Twitter and Google, all do. And they do it for marketing and advertising, but unfortunately it has an un fortunate unintended result in that it polarizes the population and it also can really hide certain key pieces of information. So I think you guys already know for information, whether it's a newspaper or whether it's an internet or whatever, if you you really want to validate, you read the far right, far left, you read all different dimensions, you read national and international, and you also uh, understand the bias of where the source is in each time and consider that in your analysis. So I think it's the same thing Bert was saying, but I kind of do it uh, a little bit broader scope. But it's critical, and now they are teaching it in schools, finally, seventh and eighth grade. We're seeing it in Wisconsin and a couple small middle schools where teaching people to be more vigilant. And I'll just leave on one note. The number one way cyber attacks happen around the world is uh, spear phishing. And that happens because somebody sees a message, and a lot of times they know they shouldn't click on it. But their habit is such, they click. And they open up 
their machine, the entire corporate network, the database is all to large exposure because they clicked on something. So it's about being vigilant and keep, for a period of time we have to do this. Later, the networks are gonna be so strong, I believe, that we won't have to do this, but right now we have to do this, everyone. See what I mean? And, and that's really interesting. Uh, as, as you're saying that and what Bert said, what goes through my mind is this one single device is the is the uh, display portal for everything that we're speaking of, for all the way from things that are completely unreliable, like uh, like uh, the tabloids, I suppose. You can probably get them on here. My favorite one on here is Onion News Network, which uh -huh. is a, a parody. Uh -huh. But yeah. some people take it as if it's real. There's been a few <laughs> cases like that. And then you've got all the way to nuclear attackers. We have things that are of 15-minute criticality, and we have things like that are a daily criticality, like your stock market report, or seasonal criticality, like how the Patriots are doing. And, and yet that same device is is seen as the output portal for all of that information. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you can get, as John said, you can get uh, bogus uh, emails and things. And uh, uh, so I think the average person has an expectation that that, that whatever, if it comes across on here, it must be right. right? Well, the, the, but, but you have to differentiate, right? You have to, if you're the, res the user of uh, this that's device. That's a level of sophistication that we have to teach then, right? So that people are. Right, so if you're yeah. getting something on your device, you should be able to differentiate between something that's coming in from a fairly you know, high level trusted source, like an emergency alert, versus something that might come in on the onion. Right, so if, if you can't differentiate <laughs> between those yeah. two information sources, then you get bigger problems than, <laughs> than <laughs> yeah. you know, using your smartphone. But we probably have to teach that somehow or well, generate people awareness. Hack the sources. People hack the information sources. So I could put a message coming out on your emergency network that says anything I want. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a, that's, that is definitely a concern, right? Because if somebody could hack <laughs> the system and send out a message that's false, to a million people that reside in, let's say, the state of Hawaii, then that's a, um, that's a breach of security, right? And that's a bigger problem. Well, that's where the you malicious inputs can occur. Called swatting, where uh, on, the, on the internet games, these guys playing, you know, the uh, right. shoot them up game. Right. But uh, one of them's very angry at another one. So he literally called in that there was a, um, a humanitarian problem, a, a uh, I guess a, disaster uh, at a certain place and there was a guy with guns and doing all this stuff so the cops showed up to this innocent house and killed a guy because they thought he had was reaching for a gun as he was opening the door and he was an innocent man and it was done because somebody had called in a warning because they were mad but losing on a video game and that just happened the three days ago it's amazing but that's that's even using the internal system against itself <laughs> yeah, but it does happen so Again, you have to be very, very careful about these sorts of things. And so what we have is a, a situation where the user uh, needs to come up to the sophistication level of the device mm -hmm. and the qualification level of the various sources and be able to sort all this out. I'll bet involving our personal knowledge, like information from our families, we probably have an assessment built in because we know what our family members are doing, what they're likely to say. And so if we get something from our family, we can make that assessment. Uh, if it's something from a source that's, that we're not really familiar with, it adds this new dimension of, of how do you actually uh, go forward and making make some kind of assessment. Mm -hmm. So uh, some form of uh, maybe a game or something that people can play where Simon says, you know, that was a, that's what we did as kids, right? <laughs> And uh, he didn't do it unless Simon said to do it, right? And so there's some form of that that has got to have to apply here. We're going to have to figure out some way to make the real stuff come out of here and stand tall, and that that isn't real uh, or should be checked. And we'll, let's get back and talk about how we're going to do that from an educational, from an outreach perspective after our break. Sounds good. Be right back. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch. And every other Monday at 3 p.m., 
you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. We are back, folks. Ted Ralston here, Bert Lemon in the studio in Honolulu, John Mullen standing by in San Francisco on our weekly show, Where the Drone Leads. This is a noon hour on Thursday, and the world, as you know, sets their watch by tuning into this the show. show. Right. If this show is on, it must be the noon hour on Thursday. <laughs> so thank you guys for coming on. We're having a pretty interesting conversation here, I think, about how the average person in the public can be a, a, alerted, made aware, and made skillful in order to sort out information that, that uh, is uh, rapidly changing or is really impacting that wasn't expected. And exactly what you, how do you assess whether that's something you should react to? Mm -hmm. Or you should tell other people, I heard it, but I, I, here's how I'm discounting it, and here's what I'm going to do. So I was just thinking, uh, in a break we were talking a little bit, but in, uh, in the world of airplanes, which I come from, uh, this problem's been dealt with for a long time, and you have a guarded switch. You have a lot of stuff in the cockpit. Certain switches are guarded. There's a guard, a mechanical latch that you have to lift before you mm -hmm, can actually mm -hmm, operate mm -hmm. the switch. And the mental message is, something really interesting is going to happen when you operate that switch, because you have to lift the guard to get to the switch. So I better think twice, do I really want to hit that switch? Or there's another story that goes around that uh, if that switch in the cockpit it doesn't work very well, looks like it's kind of corroded and maybe it hasn't moved for a long time, nobody else ever had to use it. I'll bet you don't have to use it either. Exactly why would you want to? Well, to what, what, you're, what you're talking about now is user interface. Okay, right? which is this. Yeah. Right, right. And, in the, and I think that's why there's a lot of good lessons that are going to be learned as a result of this you know, false alert. If the user interface for the person that's actually responsible for potentially you know, pushing that button or, or selecting that hyperlink, if the selections are presented in a fashion where the, the test is right next to or very close to the real message or the message <laughs> announcing oh, that there's the, a, the consequence a, of, yeah, okay. a, a ballistic missile, then the, the likelihood for an mm -hmm. error mm -hmm. is, is higher. Now, I, I often tell people in a situation where you're about to send out an email, let's say you have a, uh, a mailing list and your mailing list, uh, you know, could be MailChimp or whatever, right? A lot of the mailing list applications will tell you you're ready to send this out to the community of whoever, whoever you're sending. So it could be like 50 people or it could be 5,000 people, right? Or it could be a million people. So when you're ready to send it out, are you ready to send it out to this million people? It already it all, it tells you what the what the consequence is. Now, if you had a if you had a drill message, it probably wouldn't go out to a million people, right? So if there's a way to tell people that this is how many people you're going to reach, and again, it's it's hmm. it's all about the user interface, and it's it's a you got to look at the guy that's actually sitting there having to decide what are some of the safeguards to help him make that right decision in the moment where. Maybe he has to make a quick decision. So, so enabling him to make a better decision by in, by intelligent design of the of the interface, right, so right, that right. ordering pizza and, and and alerting a missile attack aren't don't look the same, uh, is an important aspect. And human factors, uh, big time. Right. I mean, yeah. the simple example that I just brought up. I mean, if you're, if you're going to send out a test, probably the test is going to go to. I don't know, five people, half a dozen people, however many people that test goes out so to, you, right? So you're familiar with test five people and they know what's going on so right, they're gonna react right. properly. And then you got this alert, mass a alert, people, uh, yeah, a million people. Yeah. Are you ready to tell a million people whatever you're yeah. gonna, I'd probably say, mm, no, I don't think so. So some kind of a scaled yeah. <laughs> alert awareness uh, risk factor, right. risk management goes on. So again, you know, it's kind of all in that user interface. Mm -hmm. How did it, how was it designed? So we'll, we'll presume that the that that'll, that will be discovered, and that'll be a an a piece of the design that's going to go on here to go as, as hopefully go yeah, fix this. Right, right. But we still have the issue of the uh, this user interface because mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. that alert looks the same as the pizza order or the Patriots football score. They all look this, they all have the same level of apparent credibility. They all have colors on them, and they all you know something you can read mm -hmm, quick. Mm -hmm. So we still have the issue of uh, alerting the public 
to helping them make that assessment, that multi uh, sensor multi-direction. Well, I think system. that's where, you know, again, um, uh, the the validation of the message that yeah. you got. Whether it comes in as a little message uh, window, it pops up and it says emergency message, that's one way, right? I mean, you've got that. Now, if, you, if it gets substantiated by, let's say, sirens going off, or perhaps you start to see on your other feeds, whether it's Twitter or other messages that might come in from other agencies, that now substantiate the fact that you know you got an authentic message. I think that would help your decision. The, the, what we have to do, and we need to get John's ideas here as well, but I think that that is a level of sophistication and understanding that we have to generate mm -hmm. and, and somehow let the public uh, uh, define what those sources are they're gonna look at and program their phones and such to bring that in. And we had that experience in Waimanalo a couple of years ago when we were working with the CERT, the Community Emergency mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Response Team. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions raised was, uh, what sources of information should we look at in Waimanalo? Mm -hmm. And as the conversations went on, it turned out there were about 15 different sources one could program and look at that would provide different forms of information that Waimanalo ought to know about. But there was no Waimanalo package. There was no one thing that you would look at. You had to be an alert observer and consumer of information mm -hmm. and make that decision yourself. Because weather, for example, traffic, these things all have multiple means of, of uh, uh, delivery to us. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about uh, a level of uh, awareness and alert that, uh, and alertness that goes above what we've been before, generated by multimedia mm -hmm. systems and social media, which we probably ought to drop the word social, it's media, right? Whether it's Social or well, you know, the, the, the key thing that you have to remember too now is that social media is immediate, right? Everybody is very useful, this immediacy okay. of, of yeah. getting your messages. So whether it's coming in from the emergency alert system or coming in on Twitter, you got to, you know, peep, that's why people were probably overreacting because all this stuff was coming in immediately. Okay. And so, you know, once again, uh, and, and John, your ideas here in terms of uh, trusted software and such, the aerospace industry wouldn't exist if it weren't for trusted software that mm -hmm. does exactly what you say when mm -hmm. you throw a switch. There's some, actually there are some problems sneaking in when very complicated systems uh, have to be reduced to code and the physics and the code writer weren't on the same table and so we have some problems of that type. They get sorted out. But uh, EAL, for example, uh, the equivalent uh, assurance uh, level is one means right. of determining credibility in software. Could that concept of equivalent assurance level somehow flow over this use of social media in some way, John? Sure, sure. It, it, what what the EAM levels? Uh, the higher you go, the more testing. You know, so uh, you try to test out all combinations, all possible events. Um, but I think you know we had three situations here. One of them is where the emergency people are trying to do a test, and and I think Bert said that one correctly, right on the button as far as how to best manage that. The second one is a real event that really happened, and that, thank God, is not where we are. The third one is an accident that happened. And the accident came out of the system, and, and I'm not trying to tell people how to do their job, and I'm sure the organization's very well organized and run and everything. In, in our systems, we would probably not allow a message out like that unless two separate people uh, validated. And it's not hard to do that. So, and that's not, that's not on your end reading it. That's on the end of the guy sending the message out. And what that would do is minimize accidents. I mean, it wouldn't do anything about the testing and it wouldn't do anything about the real events, but it would minimize accidents. And it doesn't take that much to do that. So that would be one of my recommendations on the other side, okay? But as far as, uh, as far as trying to raise the level of vigilance of everyone, we've been trying to do this in corporations and military for years and years and years, it, some success. Uh, not as much as we'd like, I'd like to say. We've also studied with teams of people uh, human cognizance, so you understand certain <laughs> things a certain way. And that's we're trying to solve that problem of the spear phishing. We have some hardware solutions and software solutions, but the, just ha making sure everyone's vigilant, because you're sitting at your desk all day long, you're working very, very fast, and all this money, in the, and you just click on something. It's just habit, you see, and, and now you've opened up the whole corporation without even knowing it in a tenth of a second <laughs> so and that's how those things happen and, and uh, so trying to raise the level of co cognitive ability or, or just basically vigilance is very very difficult 
educating any large space is very, very difficult, you know, and we have to keep trying, uh, but there also are some software and things that can be done. Um, the one that, the, it's a group called Iconics in Silicon Valley, and uh, they do a very good job with parts of this. Uh, the whole trade-off is, if you really try, start to enforce this in the email, what happens is there will be some times that you block access to a valid person, and that might make some people mad. You won't be too many times where it's a false positive and you block it anyway because you think it's a malicious actor, right? But that's far better than you know every now and then blocking bad guys and every now and then getting one that's not not really a bad guy. You have to stand up and you have to go solve the problem, but that's better than having the whole system vulnerable. So I think there are things that can happen in software on that device. Uh, you know, one problem is every day you got a different piece of software from a different group and making those all work together is not the easiest thing in the world, right? Uh, but if the government wants to do it, like the Ad Council kind of manages uh, press out through different media, if they really want to do it. It's something I think is extremely valuable. It's training people to be more vigilant. But it's not easy. And, and, and if we could break that down to elementary and scholastic levels and start injecting that into the class environment, uh, I think that's something we're all going to have to face sooner or later here so that the kids can learn like that we're doing on drones. The kids learn about drones and advise their parents. The same thing here. Mm -hmm. Mom, don't click on that. Don't, don't respond to it that way. Don't do it when you're driving. <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Well, to, to John's point too, you know, there has been very sophisticated filtering um, um, services that, that uh, will actually help reduce the amount of spam that you're getting. So I know there was a day okay, when so you, you were getting that, all huh? kinds of spam in your inbox and services, you know, like Google will, will filter that spam. Now, the level of sophistication to determine whether it's a uh, spear phishing attempt or whatever, I mean, that's another level of sophistication, but you, you know that people are working on filtering and looking at keeping your inbox as clean as possible, right? And there's probably also people looking to defeat that. I mean, it, it, sure, it's right, going to be right, a never-ending right. uh, role between the guys who want to make the <laughs> internet useful and those who want to send take garbage out of it yeah. somehow. Right. Yeah. And, uh, well, this has certainly been an exciting week for us. And, uh, <laughs> oh, John, how do we get a hold of that list you've got of uh, anonymous operations to keep your identity clean on the web? Well, there's a couple of places you can go to try to get this information. One of them is the Electronic Frontier uh, EFF Foundation, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Oh, Bert's nodding. You know all about that, Bert, right? I don't agree with all their things on there, but they do tell you how to be anonymous. And then another one is the BitTorrent world. You go through there and they'll tell you all the tools. Another one, the one I like the most is probably DuckDuckGo, which is a search engine competing with Google. Uh, uh, but it has, it's open source and it never traces you, no tracks, no anywhere. There's a marketing badger that does it for all the websites. Uh, that Because uh, a lot of times websites will come and try to get your credentials out of your own machine. And this, and they won't act unless they think they get it. So this thing will feed them fake credentials all the time, and they're all happy. They're going down the road thinking the marketing group, thinking they got all your stuff and they don't have anything. And so there's all these little tools, and if you put them all together, and, and it, they work even if you're going internationally to certain countries that do very invasive uh, investigation, really China, Turkey are the two big ones right now. If you have the right tools, you can go through there and be completely anonymous. So, but, but it takes time to put them together and investigate. But there's full tutorials on each place I just mentioned, full primers on how to do it. Uh, <laughs> one thing we try to do on the show is, is walk away with something we're going to go do as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Let me appoint Bert as the receiver of the information John just provided since you were nodding so vociferously during the conversation. And let's figure out a way to make, make that available through DBED. We both have association with DBED in some way, but stand it up, and, and we got the legislature just started up yesterday. Let's take that on. Figure sure. out okay. some way to figure out, here's, how to, here's a couple of pages to read about to start you down the path of becoming safe, anonymous, and, and, ability, and with the ability to assess from different perspectives. Let's do that. Sounds good. Well, yeah. and you know, we could also just do it through our own personal channels but that I mean, we have help access other people, to. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, John Mullen, thanks very much for joining us from across the shining seas in California. And, uh, Thank we'll, you. We'll nice get you on again you, sometime, and get you on when Daryl Wong gets back.
And Bert Lum, thanks Thank you. for coming down from around the corner. Yeah. And, uh, nice meeting you, John. We'll see you guys again. Thank you. Thank you okay. all, and uh, we'll see you all next week.